Today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com slash Atheist Nomads. Over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. That's audibletrial.com slash Atheist Nomads. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 42. Unfortunately, we will not be talking about the meaning of life, the universe, and everything, uh, but it should be a good show. Uh, We'll be talking about how to create atheists a bit later. Oh, my. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So, joining me today is Dustin, and I am Wesley. How are you? Whoa, that sounds backwards. (laughs) (laughs) Completely, yes. Oh, fun times. I'm I'm doing doing good. Uh, Doing good. Yeah. Anything new? Um, Nothing uh, at a point worth talking about yet. All right. Yeah, how about you? Uh, I'm enjoying a very long winter's break. <laughs> oh, nice. Government workers, yeah. Uh, back in the day, it was either all of us get drunk in the shipyard or our separate government jobs wherever we were, or they just forced everybody to take time off from work. Oh, so, so are you getting drunk at home? Uh, no, I, I'm actually going out to do that. Okay. Damn near every night. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we just had a Christmas party for my local atheist group, skeptics group, both of us. And I made just shy of a gallon of homemade Baileys, and it was awesome. Loved it. Nice. And about six, seven pounds of fudge. Holy shit. (laughs) Yeah, homemade fudge. Gave my arm a good workout. It's nice. It's almost like masturbating. Now, as far as show-related stuff, I've been Hmm. looking at options for trying to cut down on our hosting costs a little bit so that some of the money coming in we can use for, you know, things like going to the American Atheist Convention and trying to better the show. Uh, So definitely going to be trying to find something cheaper since the current plan we're on uh, expires here in about six weeks. And Hmm. uh, when it expires, re-upping part of it involves a very large chunk of cash. Oh, screw that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't okay. want to get locked into a two-year contract. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I'm also looking at possibly trying to get rid of phone contracts. Hmm. So if anybody out there in the listening audience knows any uh, good hosting options, you know, you might want to write into contact at atheistnomads.com. Mm-hmm. No, and, and, of course, we will be uh, talking to Archway Hosting. Yeah. Who's yeah. advertising with us. Yeah. Yeah. If I can hear, that'd be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all, right. all right, and uh, <laughs> we got a little bit of feedback. Did we now? Uh, well, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, some jackass named Omar Khan. Oh no, you're not doing this guy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I, I all I'm going to say here is we got some fun Muslim craziness thrown at us. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair. Yeah. If you're going to write us and you have some kind of a theological agenda, I would highly recommend that you think through what you're going to say. It was some sort of like Muslim metaphysics. Uh huh. You, you should recognize that it's important in any discussion to have some kind of epistemological common ground. And that common ground that's equal across all people is, well, Empirical evidence, that which we can see and touch, that that we can physically experience, that's the, the epistemological common ground. If you start pulling off some, some crazy bullshit, uh, it's not going to go very far. And also, don't... Don't threaten hellfire. Yeah. Real threats, definitely not cool. Uh, if you, hmm. you level real threats, we may contact the authorities. Hmm. But even imaginary threats, like hellfire... Not cool. Uh, Not that, cool, and it makes you sound fucking stupid. Yeah, it, it's it's an appeal to consequences <laughs> that is a logical fallacy. You could have told me that a, a unicorn is going to ram its fucking horn up my ass. Same thing. 
It sounds like it would hurt a lot, but in the end, probably not going to happen. Well, unless you're talking about people that wear... Hey, I didn't go to furries, man. I didn't, I didn't I'm touch not furries. going with furries either. Uh, <laughs> I've heard something about like strap-ons on your forehead to make sure, you a unicorn. Sure, but these are dildos, not horns. No. <laughs> and then, of course, there's everybody's favorite kind of unicorn. Oh, right, right. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com or you can call us at 541-203-0666. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, supporters, we, we've got the list in the show notes and on the website. We have had no new nuclear sponsors. Um, so go ahead and step on up and take the Russell Challenge. Russell. If you're going to go shopping on Amazon, uh, go ahead and uh, just check out our website, follow the link, and uh, do your shopping. For If anybody uses it over the, the holidays, approaching Christmas, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much from the bottom of our godless hearts. This day in history, January 2nd, 1890, President Benjamin Harrison welcomes Ellis Sanger as the first female White House staffer. So, during an otherwise uneventful presidency, um, you know, Benjamin, he actually uh, helped uh, get involved with uh, the uh, women's suffrage movement. Uh, sorry, the, the Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and they were able to, you know, get some, get some females into the, into the public offices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not really sure if, uh, if Sanger actually supported women's suffrage because most of that stuff's been lost over time. But, uh, yeah, Harrison, he actually definitely had a, um, had some involvement with that, and so, you know, get on him for, for being part of the solution and not the problem. Yeah. Well, now, I do want to say that the uh, this suffrage movement at that time had lots of awesome, awesome goals. Uh, they wanted stronger mm -hmm. female property rights, i.e. equal rights yeah. to property inheritance. I.e. rights at all. Yeah. Uh, employment and educational opportunities. They wanted improved uh, divorce and child custody laws. Since that time... The man won, always. And they wanted rep reproductive freedom. They had one goal, though, that I cannot get behind, and that was temperance. Hmm. Tell us what temperance is. Uh, they were the ones that, as soon as the men were all shipped off to Europe for World War I, got the prohibition of alcohol. Ooh. Ooh. This day in history, 1962, the Weavers folk group... Uh, gets banned by NBC after refusing to sign a loyalty oath. Yeah, so uh, you might have recalled the Red Scare of the 50s and all the communists. You, you, you kind of think all that kind of fell by the wayside as far as, like, public TV and public shamings went uh, by the 60s. But, yeah, no. Uh, Anti-communist fervor was still still definitely a thing in the early 60s and yeah they they actually got uh basically blacklisted for for not signing their their oath <laughs> holy crap yeah so yeah they're supposed to be on the jack parr show uh but they actually got canceled uh so the importance of the weavers to the folk revival late 50s uh really can't be understated i mean uh Pete Seeger, uh, founded with, uh, Lee Hayes in 1948. There wouldn't be any Bob Dylan, no Kingston Trio, no Peter, Paul, and Mary. And, you know, these guys were like a real big part of that movement. So they're getting blacklisted. Actually might have hampered the development of our cultural musical identity. No, oh, there was all just a bunch of commies anyway. <laughs> Yeah, fuck the folk singers. <laughs> Can't understand what the hell they're saying. At least not Bob Dylan. I, I saw him one time. And I, I swear I could only pick out like one word in ten. But, <laughs> but still, you know, it could have been the horse tranks that he doesn't, that he probably doesn't use. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Anyways. So this this one's a uh, kind of odd. All oh, those Europeans. 
silly Europeans. This day in history, 1971, football fans, i.e. soccer, uh, crashed in a stadium stampede. Yeah, so picture this lovely day over in Glasgow, Scotland, when 66, 66 people are trampled and squished and killed as they attempt to leave a game after a late goal by the home team. Uh, Trying to beat that traffic rush? Obviously. (laughs) That's insane. Uh, Initial reports suggested that the disaster was caused by fans returning to their seats after hearing the last goal, but in fact it was simply the crush of spectators all leaving at the same time in the same stairway that led to tragedy. And this wasn't even the first time that that disaster like this had struck that that actual stadium, which was the Ibrox, I think, I-B-R-O-X stadium. Yeah. Ibrox, uh, Ibro, Ibru, something. Ibru. Mm, Scotland. I, yeah, that's my best horrible Scotland Scottish accent. But, yeah, holy shit. <clears throat> I mean, <laughs> this is a, a sports ball thing, and I, I just don't see the... The grand appeal. But, oh, poor guys. <clears throat> also, in, uh, turns out in September 1961, another stairway crush had 13 people killed, uh, and another two injured, but, uh, oh, fuck. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reading through this and, uh, man, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't even understand this. Why? Why? Hmm. Anyways. Yeah. I'm not even going to go with this worse. Uh, holy shit. Uh, the worst soccer disaster in Scottish history and the worst ever in the United Kingdom was 96 people died in Hillborough in 1989. Wow. Uh, this, wow. You're starting to have numbers like a small town of, of death because of fucking soccer. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, you know, soccer that fans really are the worst. Uh, apparently, holy shit! Yeah, if you look look around the world, okay, you've got people getting crushed in in the UK. You get riots, regardless of whether the home team won or lost, all over Latin America, Canada, Africa. I don't fucking get it. I'm sh- no, crushing people trying to get out of the stadium or rioting because your team either won or lost. What the hell? They just want a fucking excuse to do, to to knock shit over. It, it's it's mind boggling. <laughs> Sports aren't worth it. <laughs> no. Seriously. Ah, oh, god damn. Uh, though I am at least happy that the Seahawks did just like kill the Rams. Uh, what was it, nine to twenty-seven? But you know, hey. Oh yeah, football's not I, over I, and, yet. <laughs> and you know what? When they won, I said hooray. And that's about the the, the sound of it. Hooray. Mm. You know what? I didn't go out and like kick a a little dog or, you know, try and push somebody down the stairs or anything. <laughs> fuck. Yeah. What the fuck? Crazy. Anyways, all right. So, this day in history, 1974, President Nixon signs national speed limit into law. Yes, uh, the Emergency Highway Energy Conservation Act uh, set a new national maximum speed limit. Prior to 74, individual states, they were able to set their own speed limits with their own, within their own boundaries, and highway speeds range from between 40 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice at 80? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, the United States and other industrialized nations uh, enjoyed access to cheap and easy oil from the Middle East, but uh, in about 1972, that changed dramatically. Um, yeah, you might have heard of a little thing called OPEC, which is the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, they basically stopped shipping oil to the U.S., Japan, and Western U- Europe, and kind of brought us all to our knees by basically quadrupling the price of oil and strangled the shit out of us for a while. <clears throat> So, um, that was, so all this is actually tied into this, uh, speed limit thing here. Uh, basically, 
setting uh, highway speeds to 55, which was intended to force all Americans to drive at speeds deemed more fuel efficient, thereby cutting U.S. appetite for foreign oil, which uh, didn't really work that well. People continue to buy really fucking expensive gas, and, you know, we actually had, like, uh, rationing. Um, I remember that my mom told me that there used to be, like, fuel rationing, that people would have to go in on certain days to get gas, and, yeah, crazy shit. But, uh, anyways, yeah, cars started getting more fuel efficient and all that happy stuff, but, yeah, anyways, today's speed limits vary. Well, that's really all I got for history. All righty. For you, the listeners of Atheist Nomads, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You might want to check out Not the Impossible Faith, Why Christianity Didn't Need a Miracle to Succeed, written and narrated by Richard Carrier. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash atheistnomads. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash atheistnomads for your free audiobook. And now it's time for science and technology. First off, we've got Kirobo. This is a Japanese robot that can speak autonomously and is in space. This is the first humanoid robot with speech capability in space. He is currently keeping uh, Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata company as they test out autonomous conversations. And for some examples, uh, the uh, robot's been asked how it feels about being in a zero-gravity environment. And Kurobo's reply was, I'm used to it now, no problem at all. (laughs) What's really cool with this robot is it doesn't just use pre-programmed responses. It's programmed to process questions and then look at its vocabulary to actually construct an answer. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the the astronaut has had to speak a little more slowly at times for the the robot to have time to process it, um, and there have been some some awkward pauses. But by and large, this robot's doing very well, and it's slated to stay at the space station through the end of 2014, and is well pretty fucking cool. Uh, since we did just pass Christmas, um, the uh, robot did say that he wanted to ask Santa for for a toy rocket for Christmas. Ooh, that sounds awfully not like a, that actually sounds like a rather Christian robot. <laughs> From Japan. Uh, yeah, right. I find it interesting that uh, the the deal time uh, commercial little ad right below the heading of the, of the story says tiny micro bikinis on deal time. Um, That's what mine has. Bargain price is smart deal. Save on tiny micro bikini. <laughs> I've I got know. ads blocked right now. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, great Christian robot <laughs> making At least converts Christmas everywhere. Celebrating. You don't have to be Christian to celebrate Christmas. <laughs> this is true. Japanese do love our holidays. Mm-hmm. He should go over there for fucking Halloween. It's awesome. I bet. It, I bet it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. The. Uh, A team of researchers from the University of Utah, and yes, Utah will be coming back when we get to news, but uh, anyway, um, they have been studying what's going on with Greenland, because the Greenland ice sheet is the the leading cause of sea level rise, Mm. and it's melting at faster rates than it should for the amount of observed sea level rise. And so that seeming, you know, was seeming kind of odd. They're leaving a pretty big gap. And so they started looking at it. Uh, What they actually found is that a lot of it's being stored either just below it, so between the ice sheet and the ground, or being stored in the airspace between the chunks of ice. Now, it is apparently circulating out of the this reservoir, but they don't know where it's going. Well, that's not good. (laughs) (laughs) It is good that it's trapping water, but... Yeah, it'd be kind of nice to know where it's going. So essentially, it sounds like this giant uh, ice sheet is uh, melting from the bottom? Um, Not necessarily. Hmm. It it could be melting from the top and then uh, sinking through, Hmm. filtering through the the ice crystals. Hmm. Uh, Now, they have uh, projected that if average annual temperatures in Greenland increase by 3 degrees Celsius, 
um, it will hit catastrophic rates of, of melting. Okay, well, that's definitely not good. No. <laughs> no. Uh, especially considering the fact that the record high temperature ever recorded in Greenland was this past July at 25.9 degrees Celsius or 78.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Shit. Heck, where you live, that'd even be a warm temperature. Yeah, it would. Uh, researchers of the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory have been working on how to create crude oil. Uh, this really could be looked at as being like the modern alchemy. There was the time when it was all about trying to figure out how to turn things into gold. Now it's all mm. about how to turn it into fuel. Well, their recent efforts are actually working a lot better than the alchemy of old. Uh, they take a slurry of wet algae, put it into a chemical reactor, and it is then subjected to very hot water and very high pressure, and it can tear it apart and convert it into basically crude oil that can go through standard uh, re uh, refining processes in about an hour and a half. Wow, wow. It is absolutely amazing. Um, they're converting 50 to 70% of the algae's carbon into crude oil. That's that's actually seriously seriously fucking amazing. Mm -hmm. It took millions and upon millions of years to create in the na in nature is being done in a fucking hour and a half. Yeah. Whoa. And then they're taking the leftover water and various nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow more algae. <laughs> nice. So you actually have a, a repeating. You can, it just kind of repeats itself. Mm hmm. Whoa. Uh, this is so promising that the, and well, again, Utah's coming up. Utah based Genafuel Corporation is building a pilot plant, uh, with an industrial partner to license and use this method. I'm guessing this is the only good thing to come out of Utah for this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> All We've right. got so it's amazing how much news can come out of such a small state. <laughs> God damn. <clears throat> All right, um, anyway, keeping on 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 science. Mm, um mm. we we've got so much news. I mean, I was seriously looking at it thinking that we might have to just do a news only episode, but we're we're going to power through. New studies have been published in the Annals of Internal Medicine on You said annals. I said annals. <laughs> On how multivitamins and mineral supplements work, and found they don't really do anything. And as a result of all the evidence that's coming out, more and more doctors are coming out saying multivitamins are a complete waste of money. And sure, there are people that are vitamin deficient, and mm -hmm. you know they could take supplements for for that. But in general, people get what they need from what they eat. For example, I was at one point diagnosed yeah. as vitamin D deficient. Hmm. I took very highly concentrated doses of vitamin D, got my levels back up, and I felt amazingly better. Hmm. It pulled me out of a slump that actually got you blogging on the site and that <laughs> the p podcast can be blamed on. Because yeah, nice. I was down. I was cutting down on my my output on the on the blog, and mm -hmm. you called me on it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just I wasn't calling you on it. I was just <laughs> kind of like, hey, here's a cool article. You were expressing <laughs> concern, and then you started sending me articles. That is true. I, I I do remember that. Yeah. So anyway, what they're finding is there's actually no benefit to these supplements, but there's actually evidence that there's harm. Hmm. So unless you've got a actual, uh, an actual deficiency, you don't need to be taking any of this shit. If you do have an actual deficiency, then what you are taking should be under the supervision of a doctor who's monitoring your levels and making sure that you're getting the right amount because vitamins can be toxic. They can cause harm. And some of them, like vitamin D, uh, will actually store in places like your liver. And then if you have some kind of a problem that impacts the liver, such as the flu or a bender, it can dump all of that into your system and cause toxic levels. And this isn't some little, you know, 10, ten rat GMO uh, study. Mm -mm. This is this is actually a looking at the 
all the evidence from almost a half a million adults yeah. from different from different trials. Numerous and studies, tons of people. Yeah. If you ever have to take a, a vitamin for a specific purpose like like you did, uh, you might actually want to go to the doctor and get a prescription of them just so you know that you're actually getting what you're supposed to have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just a thought. Yeah. In my case, I was taking actual prescription vitamin D. That's a thing. Yeah. And at that point, you know it's getting proper controls to ensure purity and potency. Mm, potency. Which brings us to a new study coming from the Oregon Health and Science University hmm. looking at alcohol. Uh-oh. They took, I see where this one's going. They took monkeys and put them into two groups. <laughs> One group had access to sugar water. Mm. The other group had access to 4% ethanol. <laughs> Additionally, they did also get um, regular food and water. Mm. And they found that some of the monkeys drank more heavily than others. And mm. they vaccinated them against smallpox. Uh, the smallpox vaccine is an actual live virus vaccine, and it does it, it will make you sick. Granted, it will make you sick with an attenuated version of cowpox that won't really harm you. Um, but what they found was the monkeys that heavily consumed alcohol had the poorest response to the vaccine. But the monkeys that drank moderate amounts of alcohol responded better than the teetotalers. And better the ones that only drank water. That's what I'm meaning. Teetotalers, the ones that don't drink. Oh, you and your 20s slang. <laughs> now what they're trying to find out is why the immune system works better with moderate alcohol use. Um, they, they don't know for sure yet, but it's not news that moderate alcohol consumption has health benefits. Um, there have been studies out for a long time about the benefits of one to two drinks per day. Especially the red wine thing. Just Wait a still minute. Nasty. Right now I'm drinking red wine. Oh, goodness. But I've had more than one to two drinks. <laughs> <laughs> that just means you'll be even better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um. All right. So that's it for science. And so now we have a word from Archway Hosting. Do you have an idea for a website but don't know how to get started? Are you tired of expensive hosting draining your budget dry? Archway Hosting can help. Our fully functional hosting service starts at $20 per year. That includes hosting, databases, email, and much more. We also do web design and web development. Check us out at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. And it's time for politics and religion. A Cedar City, Utah Mormon missionary. A uh, young man uh, was on his mission in Pocatello, Idaho. Well, actually, uh, Chubbuck, a, a, uh, the town adjacent to Pocatello. Uh, but nobody knows what Chubbuck is unless you drive through it. Nobody knows what fucking Pocatello is either. Pocatello, at least people hear about that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> mm -hmm. he was uh, on his mission and had inappropriate sexual contact with a 16-year-old. What? He was arrested for sexual battery of a child 16 or 17 years old. He was charged in May. Uh, the incident occurred October of, of 2012. He pled guilty to a reduced charge. And part of the final deal between the plea agreement and the judge weighing in is local j jail time only. So no, no prison sentence. Hmm. Psychosexual evaluation, quote unquote. Sounds and dirty. treatment for his masturbation and porn addiction. Oh, that's the one thing you shouldn't take away. And if he gets his treatment for that and they determine he's not at substantial risk to reoffend, he's off scot-free with a suspended judgment. Ooh. You know, one thing I don't see in this article is his this guy's age. He looks really fucking young from the picture. A uh, Mormon missionary would be 19 to 21, maybe 22 at the oldest. Hmm. So anyway, he's back in Utah, back at Cedar City, Utah, hmm. undergoing his, his therapy for, for his porn addiction, and he got off with only 10 days in jail, and he's on probation, 
And this is seriously an example of how fuckingly ridiculous Mormons judging Mormons is. The victim's father spoke to the judge, conveying the depth to which the incident had affected the victim and their family. He then said the family has forgiven Starley and only hopes that he gets the treatment he needs. Mm -hmm. Oh, isn't that warm fuzzy? You motherfucker. Wow. All right. Lovely. And what what I think is the most ridiculous here is the Mm. court accepted treatment for this supposed porn addiction instead of an actual conviction and proper sentencing for a felony? We're talking a felony. Yeah. And if you look at this, the data, if you look at the studies that are out there, access to pornography and the consumption of pornography has a inverse relationship with sexual assault. The more likely you are to be able to see what you need to satisfy your urges, the less likely you are to inappropriately act out on those urges. But, you know, Star, uh, Starley did actually spend Christmas Day in jail, so, you know, that's got to really be a... That's got to be worth at least a year in jail. Or the other factor here, <laughs> porn addictions. You know who's addicted to porn? All men and many women. There was a study in Canada a few years back trying to find the differences in how men who watch porn and men who don't act. And that study failed because they couldn't find any men that didn't watch porn. (laughs) Not a single one. Obviously, they they didn't go to churches Um, because I'm sure they don't watch porn at all. Well, if you look at, (laughs) at, well, Utah, for a great example, where this this young man is from, it has the highest rate of porn consumption and the highest rate of the kinkiest porn consumption in the country. I've heard something like that for Muslim countries as well, Mm -hmm. that they're very high porn. I think uh, Pakistan is the highest in the world or something like that. Oh, those poor guys. Fuck. No wonder their shit's so fucked up. Uh Uh-huh. So fucking repressed. Yeah. All right. A couple of interesting rulings, and I actually did double check, and the judges are not the same between these. Uh, Both coming out (laughs) of U.S. District Court in Salt Lake. Uh, The first one was on the Sister Wives family. Uh, they had a TV show on one of those really stupid cable networks. and I think that one was TLC. Yeah, one of those. And yeah. anyway, the Brown family uh, sued against parts of Utah's polygamy laws. And the judge actually sided with them. Oh, uh, yeah, it was, was TLC. Uh, anyway, the uh, this all started when they actually had to flee the state after their show because they started getting some legal issues going on. Because Utah's uh, anti-polygamy laws are so strong, as forced by the federal government as a requirement for Utah to become a state, (laughs) that cohabitation, if you live as if you're married, counts as being married. Kind Mm. of tied in with the whole, uh, the way the LDS church was doing polygamy with this religious cohabitation. Uh, whether or not they actually were legally married. Um, granted, prior to Utah becoming a state, there was no difference between religion and government, or at least not much. Well, to, to be fair, there was a lot of uh, Mormon hate back in the day, though most of it was fairly well-deserved. De- mm-hmm. So, yeah, they made laws specifically targeting Mormons like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the part of the law that has survived is the rule that if you fraudulently acquire multiple marriage licenses, <laughs> you're guilty of bigamy. But <laughs> living with multiple religiously cohabitating wives or husbands or anything like that, they're not legal marriages. Even if you live as if you are married, if you refer to each other as if you are married, you're not married, there's no legal issue, there's no problem. Hmm. Yeah, so do the sister wives, do they all just get, uh, the first one got actually married, then the rest were just spiritual ceremonies? I believe so. <laughs> okay. Which brings us to the even more awesome federal ruling out of Utah. The uh, federal judge in Utah struck down Utah's constitutional ban on same-sex marriages. Hey. This is a different judge. This is Robert Shelby. And he wrote, 
Applying the law as it is required to do, the court holds that Utah's prohibition on same-sex marriage conflicts with the United States Constitution's guarantees of equal protection and due process under the law. The state's current laws deny its gay, gay and lesbian citizens their fundamental right to marry and in so doing demeans the dignity of those same-sex couples for more rational reason. Accordingly, the court finds that these laws are unconstitutional. The way this case was handled, and I, I've read a few different articles on this, mm -hmm. the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, which Utah is a part of, has already ruled that gay people are not a class that can be considered for civil rights issues. Hmm. So the judge acknowledging that he was barred from taking that approach, uh, because if you are viewed as a class for civil rights issues, then it requires higher scrutiny for anything that applies only to that class. He just went with the rational review. Is there a rational reason, i.e. non-religious reason, to deny them that right? And under the 14th Amendment, due process and equal protection, he could find no way that that, that applied. Uh, in the time between uh, this ruling on uh, December 20 and our date of recording on December 30, there have been numerous attempts uh, from the Utah government to oppose this. Um, there have been petitions to the judge for a stay. There have been petitions to the Circuit Court of Appeals for a stay. The Circuit Court of Appeals rejected that request, sent it back to the judge because he had not made a ruling. He declined to do a stay, and the Circuit Court of Appeals is so far ignoring the Utah government. Badass. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> within hours of this ruling, there were same-sex couples in Salt Lake City getting married. Hundreds. The county clerk and the mayor of Salt Lake City were right there officiating these weddings. That's awesome. Friends of mine were in Salt Lake for the Christmas holiday and got to watch same-sex couples in Salt Lake City get married. Now, not every county has handled this the same. Hmm. There have been some, like Salt Lake County, where Salt Lake City is, who have gone ahead and, and allowed it. Granted, they did require a couple-hour delay while they, they conferred with higher-ups. Um, mm -hmm. But other counties have decided they will not perform any same-sex marriages until they get clarification from the state government. <laughs> the last I checked, federal judges overruled the state government. Yeah. Uh, kind of the whole that whole rank thing, they, they outrank... <laughs> the governor and attorney general. Um, there's also been uh, counties that have decided to stop doing any marriage licenses until this is all determined. I guess that's the more fair of the two ways, I suppose. Definitely more fair. Going to be a dick, at least be a dick to everybody. But no matter how you look at it, there are lots of same-sex couples. Uh, one of the links in the, the show notes, you can see them. They're getting married. They a, are married in Utah right now. One of the first pictures I saw was just kind of really awesome. Um, Utah State Senator and Utah Democratic Party Chairman Jim DeBacchus and his uh, partner Je uh, Stephen uh, Justison got married. You know, mm -hmm. to, even, to even have a, a, a gay politician in Utah is still kind of amazing to me. Still cool. Fucking yeah. Hell. Another state down. Uh, which brings us to New Mexico, New Mexico. Yeah. who actually beat uh, Utah by a couple days. There it was the sa uh, state Supreme Court. Now, they'd had a, for a while, it was some counties were allowing same-sex marriage and some weren't because the state had no ruling on it. Hmm. And so there'd been that push with all of that. To require to try to get some kind of a statewide decision, and the state supreme court did, and they ruled marriage equality. There you go. As they they wrote in their their uh, decision, we hold that the state of New Mexico is constitutionally required to allow same gender couples to marry and must extend to them the rights, protections, and responsibilities that derive from civil marriage under New Mexico law. So we are now at 19 states that either currently or will soon allow same-sex marriage. The, the just, or soon is Illinois. That takes effect in, I think, June. We're just about to that tipping point. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. 19 to 31. And I, I know Idaho's got cases that are going to be coming up soon. Um, there's other states that I'm sure that Pennsylvania is one. Various other states that have cases that are going to be coming up soon in the federal courts. We're going to be getting better than California cases. <laughs> We're going to be getting cases where it's going to require the courts of appeal to make circuit-wide rulings, and it's going to require the Supreme Court to finally, here in the next couple of terms, to make a ruling nationwide. The day is coming. Especially if you've listened to, to Ask an Atheist, you've, you've heard about what's going on in the state of Washington. Mm. Uh, we've talked about it some on our show as well, but... There are so many hospitals right now that are under Catholic control and numerous major, major sales and mergers that are going to bring additional hospitals under Catholic control. I believe the numbers are that here really soon it's going to be 25% of all hospital beds in Washington are going to be under the control of the Catholic Church. And so the Washington State Department of Health has released new rules requiring any hospital changing control to get a certificate of need review. And then before that transfer can take place, they must reveal their policies on admission, non-discrimination, end-of-life care, and reproductive health care services. And those must be posted on their websites and on the health department websites. And not only is this for the public to have access to this information, but for the public to comment. Hmm. So also require that 60 days after January 23, when the rules take effect, that all other hospitals must submit policies to the state and likewise on their websites on those same topics. Uh, this has come because of Governor Inslee asking for a review of the process because of how much criticism and news stories have come based on how much control religion has over health care in Washington. Wouldn't it just be nice if a hospital just did hospital things and didn't limit? It would. And at least Washington is beginning to take that seriously. Hmm. Uganda oh, yeah. is back in the news. Their parliament has approved legislation imposing really horrible sentences for what they call aggravated homosexuality. Basically, if... They find out that people the same sex have had sexual relations. They face 14 years in prison. And if there's a second offense, it's life in prison. Here's the thing about that, though. This has been going around for, I think I wrote about this on on the blog. Uh, this is actually tamed down. These, yeah. these, these are actually, you know, Christian missionaries, Christians from the U.S. went over there, helped them write these laws. And when they went over there... The original sentence was death. There was it was you know death sentence to be mm -hmm. gay essentially. Uh, this this is this is actually the tamed down version of, of of this law. Yeah. Holy fuck. Tamed down for life in prison from two two offenses of same sex relations. <laughs> they also added some some uh, to their prohibitions the promotion or recognition of homosexual relations through or with the support of any government entity in Uganda or any other non-governmental organization inside or outside of the country, i.e., they've added in bans on any organization that is pro-gay rights. You know what? They've, they've also had, like, newspapers publishing lists of gay people mm -hmm. and urged policymakers to hang them. This is not a friendly place for it. Anybody, really? No, not at all. Oh, fuck. All right. If you're going to name and shame somebody like that, you're expecting for something bad to happen to them. Uh, yeah. Or that, that's just goading people into, you know, getting a, a fucking posse together and going out and taking justice into your own hands. Oh, okay. To put this in, in real perspective with the way this law turned out, we're both straight. Yeah. But our podcast would be banned. Oh, hell yeah. The Treasure Valley Coalition of Reason, which I'm the coordinator of, would be banned because we we marched in the gay pride parade. Uh, <laughs> we could actually probably be uh, charged with, like, inciting a fucking riot or something. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous. They, they have gone way over the top. Now, okay, same-sex relations were already illegal. 
but they have gone to the point where you can't even talk about it. At the point that you make something illegal and you make it illegal to talk about it, how can you change that? How can people try to seek change if they can't even talk about it? Ah. Which brings us to the Pope. Oh, the lovely Pope. During his Christmas appeal, he reached out to atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, the translation of his his words were something along the lines of, I invite even non-believers to desire peace. Let us all unite, either with prayer or with desire, but everyone for peace. Hey, you know what? You know who I don't see causing war and conflict? Non-religious people. I always see the religious people that are causing war and conflict. So why not say that to his own believers, to his own flock? Or let's start with something, you know, the, the Catholic Church needs to, I think, get their own house in order right now. Exactly. Don't ask us to join them in trying to desire peace, because desiring peace does fucking nothing. This the is Catholic true. The Catholic Church needs to do something about the abuse, the sexual abuse of children by their employees. The, the se second classery of women. Mm-hmm. Classery, that's a word. Look it up. Pope Frankie, get your head out of your ass and, and get your own house in order. Then you can come talk to us. Then you can come join us. <laughs> yeah. We we've been we've been doing this peaceful thing a lot longer than, than the Catholics have. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh fuck. Of course the uh time person of the year hasn't been completely all talk. Mm. On uh, December seventeenth he fired a cardinal in the U.S. who has been outspoken against women and gay rights. Okay, but, you know, it was a few few months back that he uh, fired that one of his one of his countrymen, I think, that was a, a, um, speaking out for in support of LGBT and women's rights. He fired that guy a while back, uh, defrocked him. So I guess he's just trying to keep the balance there, one for each side. But either way, his actions, while he's finally done something that matches up with his words, the One rest time. of his actions haven't. Pope Francis isn't a good guy. He might be marginally better than the last guy. But until he does something about the sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, he is complicit in that. And he is no better than a child molesting priest. Fuck you, Pope Francis. Did they actually say that that's the reason they fired this guy? He has also been publicly critical of Francis's changes in the direction of the church. Burke is still the the head of the Vatican High Court. Mm hmm. Hmm. So he's just been taken out of public action. Yeah, for being hmm. critical. Yeah. Fuck you, Pope Francis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too little, yeah. too late. That's that's not even a too little. He he's just getting one of his guys and pulling him off the the public ranks. Yeah. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, courts aren't necessarily any better. A uh, Pennsylvania appeals court overturned the conviction of the first ever U.S. Catholic official who was charged or convicted over how he handled complaints of the sexual abuse of children by priests. Monsignor William Lynn has never been accused of molesting any children. Hmm. But in 2012, he was convicted of endangering the welfare of a child for the way he handled the, the situation with a priest under his authority. Hmm. Edward Avery. And now, well, a three-judge panel decided, nope, he wasn't responsible for that child's welfare. He's free to go. Well, good for them. Because if I'm if I'm somebody's boss and that dude does some, something fucking bad and I know about it, not my fault at all. All right. I've been a boss. I was trained very well that how I handled complaints against employees would determine whether or not I was complacent in it. Exactly. To go with another example, with, with sexual harassment. Ooh. If mm -hmm. you brush it under the rug, Ooh, boy. you are equally guilty. You are equally complicit. You are equally likely to get sued. If you handle it properly, well, your ass is covered. And this bishop did not cover his own ass. 
he allowed a priest to continue to molest children. And yeah, he he deserves to spend more time in jail than the 18 months he's already served. He handled in the worst possible way, and then he didn't even get his fucking hands banged. Mm-hmm. Nothing. What the fuck? Of course, the priest working under him uh, that brought about these charges is serving twelve. Uh, excuse me, two and a half to five years in prison. Only two and a half to five years for sexually assaulting an altar boy? Are you fucking kidding me? That is not enough. No, no, hell no. Ah, oh, god damn. Uh, for a fun one, and we'll make this one quick because we are quickly running out of time and there's still some really good ones. There's just been so much fucking news. <laughs> uh, December 6th, the Mormon Church officially renounced its doctrine that brown skin is a punishment from God. Oh. <laughs> yeah, even though the Book of Mormon still says that it is. Nope, not anymore. The, apparently the, uh, Head of the church has been the, the 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 president, the prophet. Um, he has been shown, revealed by God. That, oh no, 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 that's that's not true. <laughs> oh goodness. So I'm sure there's been a few of you that heard some of the contro- controversy around uh, Phil Robertson, the head of the Duck Dynasty family. Um, yeah, so he was uh, suspended off of his show. Of- and it caused quite a big stink. Um, and about three days later, he was reinstated. Um, so I'm still wondering if this wasn't all just kind of a publicity stunt in the first place, because uh, I'm sure that the viewer number is through the roof now, uh, as is all of the uh, merchandise and all that other shit that Walmart pimps at you. God damn. Um, yeah, I hate to say it, but I actually went into Walmart about a week ago for some cat litter, I could not step five feet in any direction without seeing fucking Duck Dynasty in there. Mm-hmm. It's holy shit. So, anyways, yeah, uh, asshole is do- back doing asshole th- things uh, on the show. But uh, found a little, a couple of interesting things recently. One is that you know there's pictures floating around on quite a few different websites, including HuffPo, that show all of his kids and and him are all or at least recently, until recently, were clean-cut, nice-looking guys. Uh, you know, Phil himself was a English teacher for a few years, uh, could have went pro football, it, sports ball is what it's looking like, uh, but he had some sort of mental breakdown and, you know, fucking backwoods eat himself and made a lot of money on these fucking duck calls. His family had been millionaires for a while now. Uh all of his kids, all the boys, they're, you know, up until recently, they were, they look like fucking college frat boys. You know, they're, you know, really nice, clean cut, tanned, looks like they're, all these pictures are from like the fucking sandals commercial. That's you know, the, you know, the beach resort thing. Anyways, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, these are, these are not fucking outbacky, woodsy sort of folky people. These are fucking the 1%. And I've wanted to say that for a while. These are fucking, rich assholes and every one of your family members that, uh, you know, eats the shit up is just supporting the thing that most of them say they hate. Yeah. But, uh, you got to give it to the daily mail every once in a while cause they can find some dirt. Uh, there's a video that just got, uh, posted from a back in 2009. It looks like where good old Phil, he's, he's saying you, you need to marry girls when they're 15 or 16. Uh, just just because religion. Man. Yeah, you got to marry these girls when they're 15 or 16. They'll pick your ducks, which is a literal reference to removing dead birds' feathers. You know, he, he's, he's a fucking nutter. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, and all the controversy over all this has been crazy. Yeah. When, when you're a public voice, i.e. on a TV show... And you say stuff that the network you work for doesn't approve of, they have every right to remove your platform. Completely. This is not a free speech thing. No. This is a fucking company that's there to make money. And, you know, I could say that they did the right thing, if only for three days. But 
Yeah. Now it just seems like a fucking publicity publicity stunt. Yeah. You know, <sighs> motherfuckers. These are not nice people. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish my my voice would count for something in this, because <laughs> there were there was a a group on Facebook uh, boycott A and E until they bring back Phil. Mm-hmm. That group I stopped looking once they got 1.5 million likes in about a day day and a half. Now I don't watch. Okay, I don't I don't have cable TV. Mm-hmm. Um. But a sh- network with the name of Arts and Entertainment. Right. That doesn't sound like the network where if you've got a show, you would want to be speaking out against gay people and women. Well, how do they have a fucking... The, the Duck Dynasty? How is that an Arts and Entertainment yeah! thing in the first place? Why is that there? Or why is fucking Ice Road Truckers on history or... You know, come on, please. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> moving right along. A uh, fifth grade student in Tampa, Florida, did a speech, won the the award for his class, and was supposed to be going to the regional uh, 4-H Tropicana Public Speech Contest, and it had to do with why you shouldn't let religion promote violence, i.e. the Crusades, September 11 attacks, that type of stuff and encouraging the golden rule that it'd make a better place. So mm. don't let religion make you violent. A school administrator pulled him aside and said, nope, you need to rewrite that. It was his assistant principal. He either needed to rewrite it because it was inappropriate before school, and then he was dismissed. And it was either that or pull out, because it thought the topic was inappropriate for, you know, fourth and fifth grade students. And then, after there got became some public outcry about this... Uh, they decided, and his like his mom called and talked for four hours on the phone to school officials. Holy fuck! And district officials and representatives of the Tropicana conference uh, contest. They decided to postpone the conference and send all the parents of students that were going to be involved that would be going to it permission slips detailing all the titles to let the parents decide whether or not they want their children to hear the speech. <laughs> and the school district's uh, spokes- spokeswoman, Tanya Arja, uh, she said that, no, it didn't have anything to do with the religious aspect. It had to do with the topic of mass murders, because these are fourth and fifth graders. Well, mm-hmm. I just want to say, by fourth or fifth grade, in history class, I'm sure every child has heard about massive wars and things you could call mass murders. Yeah. These kids... I'm sure grew up hearing stories periodically about the September 11 attacks, even though, you know, they might be too young to have actually lived through them and probably get glimpses of the news, which has all kinds of stuff about terrorist attacks and wars and uprisings and all that kind of shit. People dying. A kid that young saying, yeah, let's make the world a better place and not mass murder people. I'd have to say fucking awesome. And how the hell would you say, telling people, yeah, don't use your religion to justify mass murder, live by the golden rule, how would that be too much for fourth and fifth graders? <laughs> Those are kids that I'm sure are spending a lot of time playing violent video games when they're home. Ooh. I thought the kid won. He won the ribbon for the school contest. Yeah, I know he's up at the Tropicana level. Yeah, I haven't actually heard okay. what happened with the, the final one. Okay. And, yeah. All right, next up, we've got new polling data from Harris Interactive. Hmm. Uh, They did a poll, this time, changing up how they do it, did it online, because they found, all right, most cell phones do not disturb, and landlines, that's all the old people. (laughs) So they decided to try online, and what they found is some very interesting stuff, awesome stuff, if you ask me. I I say it's all almost all very encouraging. Um, they have found that the mature generation, as they called them, the matures, 83% believe in God. 81% of baby boomers believe in God. 75% of generation Xers believe in God. 64% of echo boomers believe in God. Echo boomers slash millennials slash generation Y. Wow. Okay. 64%. Never heard of Echo Boomers. I had not either. But the echo of the baby boomers. Hmm. Hmm. As far as Jesus is the son of God, 75% of matures, 
74% of baby boomers, 67% of Generation X, 58% of, I'm going to go with the more common, let's go with Generation Y. Angels, 68% of matures, 73% of baby boomers, 71% of Generation Xers, 59% of Generation Y. The opposite shows up when you look at belief in ghosts. Well, kind of. The old people, 24%. Generation X and baby boomers, 46%. And Generation Y, only 44%. Hmm. The whole ghost part seems a little much to me. Ghosts, there's, there's, there's no evidence. It's, it's completely shit. Um, it's anyway, due to TV and movies. Yeah. Witches and reincarnation have very similar statistics as, as ghosts, although reincarnation is most popular with Generation Y. And New the older you get, the less popular. Uh, but as far as absolute certainty that there is a God, it's down to 54%. Man. Absolutely or somewhat certain there is a God. 68% total. But only 54% are absolutely certain. Uh, belief that there is no God is now up to 16%. And uncertainty as to whether or not there is a God is also at 16%. And that's up from 2003 levels of 9 and 12% respectively. That sounds like 16% atheist-ish and technical agnostic, another 16%. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good with that. That's 32% atheist and or agnostic. I'm feeling pretty good about that. <laughs> Another 10 years, people might be able to invite us into their houses without any bad things happening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there ends up being a lot more interesting stuff here. Uh, mm. As far as, as religious self-identification, uh, 19% describe themselves as very religious. 40% describe themselves as somewhat religious. That's compared to 49% in 2007. And 23% identify themselves as not religious at all. An increase from their poll in 2007 at 12%. A uh, little little glimmer here. Uh, they also included Darwin's theory of evolution, that it's actually gained 5% per- uh, change overall between all groups in, in this time period also. Mm-hmm. So, hey. Uh, creationism is down 3% overall, thankfully. <laughs> yeah. Ah, fun times. Good times, good times. All right. Uh, I saw another article recently. I, I'd heard about this stuff in the past, but... Oh, uh, there's there's proof that Noah's Ark has been discovered. Why is it this getting out in the media? Um, I, I'd heard about this work by Ron Wyatt. I think back when I was in high school. Might have been college, but it's either high school or freshman year of college. I was a devout believer, young earth creationist. And I didn't buy it even then. Now, if you look through these articles that are popping up about it, there is no compelling evidence. There is no scrutiny involved. Nothing that actually even remotely comes up to the level of being scientific. Of course, if you fact check it on Snopes, claim Noah's Ark has been discovered in eastern Turkey. They're ruling false. And they go through and completely dismantle every single claim. Uh, this kind of prompted me to suggest if you see something on Facebook, fact check it before you share. <laughs> I've always I've seen this picture quite a few times about the uh, it's a, 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 a picture of a smooth shape larger than a football field that's out on a rocky, rough terrain at an altitude of about six thousand three hundred feet near the Turkish border with Iran. And it does have a sort of boat-shaped, uh, vaginal kind of uh, camel toeish shape to it. And sure, you know what? Yeah. So what? I'm gonna come up with an alternate interpretation. Okay. God is a woman. Oh, there you go. Tell us so. Alanis Morissette. That's God. I've got another alternate uh, interpretation. The universe is trying to tell us to eat more pussy. I'm down. Okay. Okay. You've got decisions. This versus that will help you make them. This versus that is an all-new six-hour series that uses science to investigate the world within arm's reach. For instance, what's the fastest way to navigate through highway traffic? Just stay in your lane and creep along, weave in and out of cars, taking advantage of every opening, 
or is it faster to take surface streets? This versus that will reveal the answer to that question and dozens more. This versus that is the web's number one choice for science enthusiasts, skeptics, and critical thinkers. Go to thisversusthatshow.com. Again, thisversusthatshow.com. This versus that. No bias. No bullshit. Just science, fact, and funny. Use offer code NOMADS when checking out to save 25% off your purchase at thisversusthatshow.com. That offer code, once again, is NOMADS. Joining us now is Peter Bogosian. Peter is a philosophy professor at the uh, Portland State University. Um, He is the author of... The amazing book we'll be discussing today, A Manual for Creating Atheists. He is a jiu-jitsu master, a (laughs) sci-fi fan, and has a dog. Peter, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm absolutely not a jiu-jitsu master. <laughs> I, just want to, I just want to clarify that in no uncertain terms. Uh, my dog is next to me. And uh, did you read the book? We of have read the book. That is awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, that delights me to no end. And, and well, for, for other authors uh, that might be listening, uh, wanting to come on our show, if you send us the book, that will greatly increase the chances that we'll read it. <laughs> Yeah, no promises, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we. I, I heard of a certain Ellen that didn't read the book earlier. So, yeah, I wanted to read the book first. And did you like the book? I Don't, I, don't sugarcoat I, it. Say I'm it not even going to bullshit. Okay. Uh, I, I love the Socratic method, so you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. This is actually really good information. Going through it, I, I kept thinking of... Uh, you know, one of the things that the atheist community uh, here in Boise, where I'm at, uh, does is, and, and we're working on increasing this, is being involved in, in various parades, fairs, festivals, and the like in Boise. And working that booth, periodically you'll get religious people that come up. And there was one that was uh, right when we were trying to close down at uh, a particular fair in the fall, uh, just a couple months ago, that it was this gentleman and his daughter and her boyfriend and he was probably in his, you know, around 50, and his daughter was probably late teens. Uh, they come up, and they started talking to uh, someone from the Humanists of Idaho, and they went on and on and on and on, and this gentleman was obviously trained by uh, Matt Slick in all of his particular methods to try to trick people up using little logical tricks. And it would have been having the, the the information from this book in a situation like that would be absolutely awesome. I don't think it would do anything with the particular uh, slick trained person, but at least for his daughter watching. See, that's fan- how old was his daughter? Probably about seventeen, I'd guess. Do you happen to remember any of the things that he said to you? Uh, I was at first sitting back, listening, just in uh, just really curious as to to where it's going to go. Uh, because I wasn't the person that initially started talking to him. Oh, okay. And so I, I let the other the person that was talking to him uh, continue the conversation. By the time they'd basically repeated the conversation, I got bored with it and started cleaning up. Yeah. All right. So here's a question. I mean, the, the main drive, the main focus of your book is you're trying to create a street epistemologist. Mm-hmm. What the fuck is that? What are what, what are the basics? <clears throat> Boy, it certainly helps uh, knowing that you guys have read the book. It makes it much easier for me. So thanks. I'm, all, I'm always just like, every time someone asks me a question, I'm always just so taken aback that they've taken the time to read the book. I, I feel such joy that it's actually difficult to answer I, I, the question people are asking me. Uh, I'll, so I'll be honest. I just saw the phrase a few times on different pages. So I was like, that must be key. Okay, well, then that's good. That's good. At least. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, so basically it's uh, epistemology is how you know, and street epistemology is this idea that we can help people to develop reliable mechanisms of belief formation, and we can do that solely by speaking to them. We can help them impose a corrective mechanism on their own cognitions and consequently change their beliefs or not uh, accordingly. We can help them to reassign confidence values to their beliefs. I mean, we all assign confidence values. How confident are we in some belief? And street epistemology can facilitate the realignment of confidence values to beliefs uh, based upon um, evidence and reason. Hmm. Okay, so you're not actually trying to take on their 
the religion or demons or angels or anything. You you just want to tackle their beliefs, their the base there then. No, I don't even want to tackle their beliefs. I, I want to tackle their belief forming mechanism. And so if we can help them to develop a reliable or more reliable way of forming beliefs, that's an epistemology is how we know. We can help them develop more reliable ways to come to knowledge then the conclusions that come about as a result of that epistemology, that base, that that uh, that root, the conclusions will then more naturally align themselves with reality. So we don't have to worry about religion or demons or what have you. Although I've been recently interested in demons, as someone has called me a demon, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <laughs> you know, there's there's something about being called a demon that's uh, humorous and fun. And interesting, and I certainly want to know how that is. But when someone in another article linked me to a Nazi, that's not very funny at all. That's just no. mean spirited. Wow, so, they went uh, full Godwin on you. Yeah, yes. full Godwin. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they, they they linked what I was doing was from a, a Canadian uh, Canadian magazine, and Stephen Molyneux had a wonderful response to to that article, a video response to that article. But, but back to your question. Um, it basically deals with the belief forming mechanism that that people have. Yeah, I, from my my own uh, experience, I can definitely say that destruction of your epistemological framework invariably destroys faith. Uh, in, in my own in my own journey, I was you know, I'd had have doubts about specific doctrines, but a doubt about one doctrine doesn't destroy faith. That's exactly when I finally true. reached the point where it was like, okay. Uh, I'm I'm preparing to be a pastor. I want to go back to the Northwest. I am going to be facing these, you know, godless heathens out there. Uh, what can I do to try to prove them that what I'm offering has any validity to it? Yeah. And the more I started to dig into that, the more I started to discover there's nothing. Right. And that's what, what actually destroyed my faith. Well, that's a type of honesty with yourself. Uh -huh. You're honest with yourself. And that's the first step. The first step in all of this is to be honest. If we can't be honest with ourselves, then it's a charade. The whole thing is a facade. Mm -hmm. So I think to a large extent it comes back to what people value and how do we help people change. So so a lot of this stuff is about an, ad, an attitudinal disposition. How do we help people value those I don't know, properties or principles or those things which will help them to lead an examined life and then be honest about what they believe? It's not an easy question. I mean, I've been researching that for 20 years now. Yeah. So one thing that that uh, I kept wondering is is you've got these these examples of uh, various conversations you've had uh, littered throughout the book, and yeah. even a couple of places you mentioned that you have these conversations several times with various people throughout every day. Every day. How do you start these conversations? With sincerity. Say you're just in line at the grocery store. Yeah. How do you start that 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 conversation with the person in front of you? Well, I'm, I'm a people person, so I love people. So I love talking to people and hanging out with people and uh, learning from people. So you're in the line and you're in the store and someone's in front of you, and I don't know, it just depends what they They have something in your cart that you find interesting, and you, if you're interested, you say, hey, what's that? Is it any good? So you're all, you always start the conversation with sincerity, just the way you'd start any other conversation. You have to be sincere with people, and you have to be honest with people. And people have to know that when they ask you a question, that you'll give them an, an answer that's honest and direct and blunt. And that, that might mean that they um, don't like your opinion or they become upset, but, but it also almost invariably means that they respect you. They respect you because you're a person of your word and you, you're speaking to them sincerely. So luckily I don't have to do too much before faith emerges or some irrational belief or superstition emerges. Uh, it is, I have, uh, I'm working with the people from, from LAG in London, the London Atheist Activist Group. And for them, and even to a certain extent for many Canadians, it's more difficult because there are cultural factors in place. People don't discuss their faith as readily. They're not as interested in sharing it. Well, we certainly don't have that in this country. So, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So I don't, the, the conversation doesn't have to go on t too long before that emerges. And then once it emerges, you, just follow the template in the book. Hmm. Tell you what, I have an 18 by 48 inch approximately uh, long sign directly behind me that says, he is risen. So, yeah, right in my office. So, yeah, nobody in my office has a problem saying stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, I think that's right. I think 
it's not that, um, or it could, could be, I mean, you'd have to go country by country. It's a question of people put out these indices of religiosity, but even if people have a faith tradition or belong to a faith tradition or what have you, in some places, they're less likely to discuss that openly or they're more likely to profess a faith but not be vocal about it or not, ha- not have those beliefs emerge in their communicative interactions. And so, it's both unfortunate that people do that in this country, but it's fortunate in that that gives us an opportunity to help them. I've always thought that the United States' religiosity was somewhere along the lines of a third world nation, that we're way higher than most of the developed nations out there. Yeah, it is. And if you if you look at that, it depends what one, one means by that. But if you look at specific beliefs like creationism, I think we're number two behind Turkey. Or if you break that down in terms of just did a – just read a, a Matt McCormick's book, The Case Against Christ, and I did a book review that's up now for the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. And he gives some statistics on that, or I give some statistics in the in the book review, the number of Americans who believe the Earth is X thousand years old or deny the facts of evolution or what have you. It's it's, uh, it's pretty frightening. It's pretty frightening. Pretty frightening that, that in mass these delusions could be so conspicuous and... It's kind of like when I lived in New Orleans, someone said to me, I, I said, I can't believe that you, you still live in New Orleans. This place is just so dangerous, and so I was never really liked living there. And someone said to me, well, it's kind of like you're, you're a lobster put in the water. You don't realize it's boiling at first, and then by the time you realize it's boiling, you just can't get out of the pot, and then you die. And so, <laughs> so I think it's kind of the same thing with faith to a certain extent, mm-hmm. you know, and those that's reinforced by these in, in the interpersonal milieu that in, in which one one belongs. So, yeah, I mean, it's a complicated problem, but I think analyzing it or looking at the problem strictly in terms of beliefs is not going to help facilitate the change that we need to change. All right. So you you talked about like approaching somebody like in the store, but like what about neighbors or, or keeping you know kind of trying to keep the peace in the neighborhood? How would you approach a neighbor if somebody's you know overly faithful in your area? Well, I have a neighbors like that. Um, so look, my, my neighbors. So you know, I'm a big fan of personal transparency and accountability. Um, I don't I don't hide who I am to anybody. What you see is what you get across the board. And so when when my neighbors ask me a question. I give them an answer. Uh, they've stopped asking me questions, um, <laughs> but I always make sure that I give them a, a flyer to my talks. They want to come to my talks, and I'll, uh, you know, the neighborly thing to do. I'll give them a front row seat, and I mean that sincerely. So, again, it's this idea that what sort of person do you want to become, and how do you want others to perceive you? And, and my response to that, I mean, the, the can't tell you what path you should choose. Can tell you what path I, I think you should choose, but. My response to that is that people have to have to see what they get and they have to know that you're sincere and they have to know that you're not, you're not playing a game with them. You're not running a con. You are who you say you are and you believe what you say you believe and people will respect you as a result. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, there are atomic beliefs that we have, you know, these little discrete singular beliefs, uh, in which people may have genuine disagreements, but the way to, the way to meet those disagreements is is by honesty, is by saying, hey, this is what I believe, this is who I am, this is why I believe it, and this is what I'm about. And people can either accept that or reject that. Yeah. And if if, if they accept that, then then you have a basis to move forward in, in a in a reciprocal a relationship of trust and a relationship of respect. And if they don't accept that, oh well, you know, that's all right. One thing I really appreciated that you brought out in your book was trying to un- honestly understand the person's beliefs and reiterate them back because there are as many different uh, belief sets as there are people out there. And even if you just look at the, the most recent uh, Pew Forum uh, poll that came out, the amount of cognitive dissonance already present in so many Christians, uh, just comparing how many believe that Jesus is the son of God versus how many believe in the resurrection and uh, immaculate conception right. is kind of shocking. Yeah, before you can conduct any kind of intervention, you have to figure out what it is in which you're intervening. But but even prior to that, you maybe somebody knows something that you don't know. 
right? Maybe somebody has latched on to some feature of the universe or some fact or some knowledge claim that you didn't have epistemic access to. And consequently, the only way that you can know that is by asking them initial questions about what it is they believe and then figuring out why they believe what they believe and then analyzing if the way they come to that knowledge claim is in fact uh, or can be relied upon. So, so you have to have, you have to start these things with a sense of, well, that's, I mean, again, some of the, to me, this is really interesting. You know, oh, someone thinks you're a demon. Well, that's really interesting. Why is that? How do we know there's such a thing as demons? Oh, that's, that's really interesting. You know, what, what characteristic or feature would a demon have? Again, you, you know, asking people these questions so that you can figure out what it is that they believe. Often, one of the things you'll find is that people will use a word or a term in the way that you were not using it, and then you were like two ships passing each other in the night. You're just talking past each other. Or that people will have a conception of God that's, you know, not to be overly philosophical, but people have a conception of God that's like Spinoza, and it will be this kind of pantheistic, all-encompassing catchphrase that just means nature or something more broad. Oh, so God is love, all that stupid shit. Yeah, I can't, I can't stand that. That seems insincere to me. <laughs> people don't really believe that, right? Well, so not true Christians, TM. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and people then, and then you get you get the curveballs. You know, you, you ask off air about the reason was for some guy said on camera that he thought you, out of a megachurch Jesus was an alien. Well, that's a curveball, right? And so mm-hmm. that's not a standard Christian belief. Uh, that's not something. That, no, it, it's it's again. I can I can only speak for myself. I find that remarkably interesting. Mm-hmm. Like, why would somebody think that Jesus was an alien? If 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 there was indeed an historical Jesus, the person thinks there was, was an historical Jesus. Okay. Why would you think that? Like, how do you know that Jesus is near? That's really an extra, that's a hyper specific claim about something, about something that's already so cloudy to us. But I would like to know some, how someone knows that. Yeah. Something that I really liked from your book is that, uh, you target each epistemological claim separately. Uh, that, you know, if there's, if they say one thing, and then they just like, uh, gish gallop you, you just like, wait, 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 let's, let's take one at a time. Let's focus on this and, and go through it and yeah. break it down. Yeah, that, that's right. They can gish gallop you or they can use what, uh, notable Christian apologists have done in their ba- debates called the shotgun approach. Um, and it's basically just, you know, throwing as many things at you as possible. It's very, it, it takes more time to refute each point that they make than it does for them to make it. So almost by definition from the outset, you've lost. But the problem with importing that conception on an intervention is this isn't about winning or losing, for one. And two, there are no time moderators. So the only person in that context, I mean, you're speaking with somebody, right? It was a person in front of you with whom you're speaking and you're having this. But most people, um, again, if they're trained in apologetics, they'll do something differently and then you have to, there's a different way to, to, to deal with them. And I talk about that in the book just a little bit. But mo- most people, they're not really out to win until the end of the conversation and then they realize that their belief was faulty and they have non-epistemic reasons for wanting to quote unquote win. They want to, you know, ego or they want to justify this to themselves. But most people, they'll, they'll either, again, it depends. I mean, you, you speak to a wide variety of people with a wide variety of superstitions. But, but I found that often, you know, when people come out of the temples or the mosques or the synagogues, people actually believe that. You know, admittedly, there are a lot of people who are pretending to know things that they don't know. And there are a lot of people who have confused knowing with believing and hoping and trusting and faith, um, which gets back to your earlier question, just parenthetically, of why we need to break down these terms, why we, everybody needs to be on the same page to make sure that we know what we're talking about. But if people do that, they do this this shotgun approach to you. You just t- take a step back and say, hey, wait, wait a second, let's talk about this. And then when you've exhausted that, you've explored that in depth, then you can go on to the next topic. I actually really like that you said this is not about losing. Uh, This is definitely about the long game. You know, just trying to make a chink in their armor, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, even if you you don't, quote, unquote, make a chink in your armor, but you make a chink in your own armor, you still won. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what what Socrates says in the Gorgias. It's better to be refuted than it is to refute. Because if I have a... And I've definitely changed my mind about a lot of things. You know, you have a conversation with somebody and you realize either they know something you don't know, which is good. Even better than that is that they have a more reliable way to know things. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, But but then you can, this whole thing is like when you get in, when you can get into their base, helping them 
change their mode of thinking just a little bit. This is just kind of putting a, a rock into the cogs of, of their clock to try and sh- kind of, well, short circuit that, that clock a little bit. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. So first you said to help them, and that's what it's about. It's about helping people. And often it's important to disabuse people of an unreliable belief-forming mechanism and replace it with a reliable belief-forming mechanism. Because remember, it's very easy for people to see the, uh, I think you used the phrase, chinks in the armor. It's it's very easy for, for people to see that other people's delusions are delusions and other people's superstitions are just that, superstitions. It's very difficult for them and and to see that to see that about their own superstitions and there are reasons for that that extend into the domain of cognitive neuroscience but of which I'm not qualified really to speak on that but you know how do we help people because it really is at its base it's about helping people and how do we how do we help people to see that the um the way that the, the things that they think they know they actually don't know I and mean, some of those things they couldn't possibly know <laughs> Right. So, so how, how do we, how do we nudge people in the direction of reason and rationality? Well, that's, that's what the whole, that's what a manual for creating atheists. That's mm-hmm. one of the themes of the book. So. Yeah. Each step just make them a little bit more reasonable. Yeah. Or instill doubt. Yeah. It's, it's never a bad thing to be humble about what it is that you think that you know. It's never a bad thing to think that one could be wrong. Uh, if you don't think that you could be wrong, and I write about this in the book, it really is a monstrous epistemological arrogance that masquerades as a false humility. And that's part of the danger of faith, is it really does masquerade as a false humility, but it's a profound arrogance. Mm-hmm. It's an inconceivable arrogance. On our part, we should... That's another thing I like. I, fuck, I'm, I'm going to say that a lot, that I, I like shit in your book. <laughs> so just get used to it. I like, I like this. <laughs> On our part, we need to not be afraid to say, I don't know. You know right. if, if they give us a question... If you don't fucking know, be honest. Say I don't know, right. and look and look at them, and and you know, know that you know. Hey, if it's something that they really want to know, say all right, I'll get back to you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's not only is there no shame in saying I don't know, but it's a it's a virtue, and we need to gets back to what we discussed earlier in the conversation. We need to help people value the right things, and we're in this mess that we're in because people value the wrong things, and so one of the values that. I think we should work very hard at promoting is to help people say, I don't know when they don't know, but, but, and this is to me essential. It's not just helping people. And I really want to stress this to, to not pretend to know things they don't know and to say, I don't know when they actually don't know, but it's how do we create a culture around that? How do we form a community that values people saying, I don't know. And I'll tell you one place where that's conspicuously absent is in academia. I don't know if you saw my uh, my uh, TAM panel, the panel I was on at TAM, but I but I spoke about that. that TAM is the amazing meeting with James Randi, Educational Foundation, puts on once a year in the summer, usually in Vegas. H- how do we help create cultures where it becomes a virtue to say I don't know, where it becomes a virtue to not pretend to know things you don't know? I mean, if we can if we can do that, that that's a very complicated problem because you're talking about changing you know, the wide scale changing of values within a culture. Mm -hmm. But I think that's essential, absolutely indispensable. Oh, man. Can you imagine a politician admitting to not knowing something? Yeah, okay. Well, that's a a great example. I mean, even look at this idea of a flip-flop. A flip-flop is inherently a negative thing, as if if changing your mind based upon new evidence is a bad thing. He flip-flopped on this. Well, what do you want someone to have? I mean, even the term flip-flop is pejorative. So what do you want someone to have a... A belief, yes, I have a belief that I, I, I said that we're going to pull troops out of the, out of, uh, you know, wherever we have Afghanistan, wherever our troops are at the time, or I'm going to close Guantanamo, what have you. They become president, they become, they get access, or not even, even at any office, but mm-hmm. just to use the example, president, they get access to new information. What are they then supposed to say? Well, no, I'm not going to flip up. No, they, the, the rational person says something that couldn't be any easier. It couldn't be simpler. Look, I said when I ran that I was going to do X. But now I have new information, new troops and boots on the ground, whatever, new satellite, whatever the, the information would be. I have new evidence that has come to light that leads me to believe that that would no longer be the, the right path of action. And then people criticize her or criticize him, and you know, we need to change that culturally. Right. What else are you going to do when new evidence comes to light other than change your mind if, if that's what needs to happen? 
Yeah, and there's so much political opportunism, and there's so much jumping on people. Now, look, it's very, very different if someone were to change their mind every day, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind mm -hmm. of a mental disorder. Well, I'm I'm for X, Y, Z on Monday, and the Tuesday I'm against it, and Wednesday, and so there has to be some time that that elapses so that one could have a considered opinion based upon the best available evidence. But it just attacking people because they've changed their mind about an issue, a public policy issue, that's just political opportunism. And so those sorts of things, it's more important that we, that we lay the groundwork in our culture and our society for people to value the right things than it is for any one public policy, with the possible exception of the Supreme Court justices, um, than any one public policy become adopted. And the reason is because that if we can promulgate the right values, if we can help people value the right things, then many of these problems, not all of them, I'm not going to be Pollyannish about it, but Pollyanna about it, but many of these problems will take care of themselves. Like belief revision is one of those values. If we can help people to understand that it's important to revise one's beliefs in, in light of new evidence, then there, that's kind of a corrective mechanism in place in society so that we can have honest, sincere, rational, evidence-based discussions about what sort of sorts of life we want to lead and what sorts of rules mm -hmm. we, we want to live by. And then, just talking too much, but then we can then embody those in contemporary jurisprudence, right? So we could take those things and we can put those into not only law, but, but a legal system and a legal tradition. But we're we're far we're far we're far from that and we're far from that now. But we we need to start thinking about nudging the culture and the society in this way so that we can value those things which are conducive to living um, more humanely, more justly, and more rationally. Mm -hmm. Just from my personal curiosity, have have you ever been in any fist fights or any anything that you thought there was going to be some violence involved? Oh, you mean as a console? You mean not in an MMA comp? I mean, just in the in the context of an intervention? Wait, have you been in an MMA MMA fight? <laughs> well, well, how how did you mean the how did you mean the question originally? <laughs> I, I was talking about uh, while you're epistemologizing, while you're talking with people. Oh, it, did I ever did I ever think someone was going to attack me or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, never. All never right. Not even. No, I mean, I I mean, I I've had the the rain. I mean, I have people very angry at me. Um. <laughs> Uh, I've had maybe even in rage. I've had people cry. I've had people. I mean, I've I've truly experienced the gamut of emotions. But um, but I think one one form of protection is sincerity. If you always ask a question because you really want to know the answer and not because you're trying to screw with somebody, yeah, that's a kind of protection. Yeah. And have you been in an MMA, MMA fight? Well, I used to do, I've been doing martial arts for a long, long time, and I'm a little too old to be punched in the head right now, uh, but I do, I do jujitsu a lot. I used to do a lot of stick fighting when I was younger, but I'm, I can't take blows anyway, not even to the head. I just can't take stick blows anymore. I used to have stick kickies all over my body. They're nasty. <laughs> okay, then I have another related question. Is peeling fingers okay in a bad position, or is there a moral dilemma there? No, uh, you should never peel someone's fingers. It's totally. It's that. That's how you can hurt somebody. You can gr you can grab the uh, you can grab like I'm looking at my hand right now. You can grab uh, the knuckles and peel the wrist back. That's cool. Uh, but you, you, you I mean, you, if you really truly know what you're doing and you've set up the rules beforehand, maybe. But I would urge people. The other, here's the other problem with peeling fingers. If you think in a real fight that you'll be able to peel somebody's fingers off of you, yeah. you don't know the first thing about fighting. So peeling people's pe peeling fingers off or peeling fingers will give you the false. It will prevent your jujitsu from becoming better because you rely upon peeling fingers off. You shouldn't need to, the best guy, you don't see Marcelo Garcia or uh, John Kavanaugh or Eddie Bravo, you don't see any of these guys peeling fingers off, right? They don't peel fingers off because their jiu-jitsu is good. It, it will prevent your jiu-jitsu from emerging. So kind of like having a uh, inadequate reasoning process. And exactly. That's and, and I was thinking of that when I was talking, and there are very profound similarities between jiu-jitsu and the uh, real combat arts and uh Thinking processes, absolutely. In fact, I I wrote a paper about that that I didn't finish. An old classmate of mine told me to ask you that. Oh yeah, no, it's not a cool thing to do. You know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I'm out of shape now. I'm trying to get back in better shape. But sometimes, if I'm just like totally done, or if I'm fighting a guy who's just so much better than I am, and I'm like oh, just gassed or winded, I go for a wrist lock. Uh, 
But you know, I'm not even, I'm not good at jujitsu. I'm just a beginner. I'm not, not a beginner, but I'm just, I'm really not good at jujitsu. It's just something that's fun that keeps me in shape. Um, but again, every time you try those little tricks, you know, like the 10th planet stuff, the lockdowns, of course, those guys wouldn't say the tricks, but every time you try those little things, the, the, there are consequences that, you know, then, then you don't, do you guys know about jujitsu or am I just, Kind of talking past you here. Kind of talking past me, but I'm guessing that uh, there's definitely counters to all of those. Yeah, but I, yeah. So for so you're, say, you're say, overextending yourself. Say you're on the bottom and a guy's on top of you, and you do this thing called a lockdown. It's just you make it so that he can't move his leg. I do that primarily because I'm freaking exhausted, and uh, and I I try not to tap from exhaustion. But the consequence of that is you don't learn how to you don't learn any escapes from there. You know you don't. You know, and so the, if you look at that, if you superimpose that idea on critical thinking and rationality in general, um, you, you never want to, not only do you not want to rely on tricks, but in order to advance your, your whole game, and I'm using that, um, word as it, it's used in the co- cultural context of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but also your cognitive game, what you bring to the table. Not only can you not, and should you not rely on any tricks, but to have an emergence of a comprehensive understanding, you can't. So it's not just a practical consideration. It's a thematic understanding of what it is that you're doing. What, what's a few more, what's any more talking points? What's some good information we should have about the book? What haven't we covered? Um, um, well, uh, thematically, the book teaches people how to talk others out of faith and into reason. And that can be, yeah, go ahead. Can you tell us about the Socratic and how to, how to use that. Yeah, as I said, anything that you ask, I can either tell you about or say I don't know. So <laughs> ask me anything you want. Um, so Socratic method, it's basically a way to teach by asking instead of telling. It, call, it comes from Platonic dialogues, and Socrates was a character in the Platonic dialogues. And it's just, it's a five stage, five tier method of, uh, of inquiry that, that one can use with a conversation partner. It's basically asking questions, getting a response, and asking another question. So never really exposing yourself by giving a, a claim on your own behalf, but just asking about what they're at, what they're talking about. Um, no, yeah, I mean, yes and no. It d- depends. It depends. The purpose. It depends what you're doing. You know, it's been successful. You know, when I do these in the prisons, it's it's always or even in classes or what have you. You know, it's been successful when people start articulating good questions. And then asking you those questions. And so that's really a tremendous feeling of accomplishment for me when that happens. Um, it's basically asking, at the, at the highest level, it's asking people if they agree with themselves. Hmm. So the book talks about the Socratic method. It gives, you're right, I mean, at the end of most chapters, I think except chapter one, or maybe chapter one or two, and I think just chapter one, it gives uh, conversational templates, conversa- actual conversations I've had, some of those haven't gone well, and I've included those there. Some of those have gone well. Uh, people and people, as you as we said beforehand, they're going to be able to see this uh, on film when I do the Reason Whisper, the TV show. I think the most crazy, the craziest uh, dialogue you had in there is talking about that talking to that what seventeen year old teenage kid in the church where you know he would actually kill for God if he thought oh God that guy was actually talking guy. talking to him <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a, uh, that was a crazy dialogue. Uh, I have so many of these written down that people have been bugging me to, uh, to just write them down and, and, and release more of them, but I'm a little bit, well, not a little bit, I'm kind of overwhelmed right now, so it's difficult, but, um, you think that would be interesting to people to just have a, have a, all those dialogues, just type up all those dialogues and put them out? De- actually, yeah. yes. Uh, and you know what? I think that you and like the, the atheist pig, he puts out some online web comics. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh, he, he does some good shit. Uh, you know, I think that he could actually have a lot of fun with those too. If you, if you ever wanted to let him take a crack at him. <laughs> it's big. <laughs> oh, that would be the perfect way to release those. <laughs> Atheist pig. <laughs> That's a funny name. Uh, do, you, do you guys do you guys know the atheist pig personally? Uh, we yeah. interviewed him what eight nine months ago, I think. Oh, oh that okay. was that was longer than that. It was back like episode seven. Was it really that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You are you are actually number forty two. Oh, I'm episode number forty two. Okay. You are. So, any other questions you guys have about anything? Anything on your mind? Uh, yeah, tell us about this TV show you've got. 
Hell yeah. Well, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I don't know who's going to fund it yet. I don't know what route we're going to go. I'm not sure about, uh, I'm not sure about the distribution. Um, but, but basically it's called the Reason Whisperer. And that's me, the Reason Whisperer. And I, uh, uh, find people in churches, mosques, temples, and synagogues, and I help them along their journey to deconversion. And it's 100% real, no scripts, no actors. There's a Facebook page called The Reason Whisperer uh, that we put up, and we should have a trailer coming out almost any day now. Um, oh, and then it's just totally uh, non sequitur, but the, uh, I also found out that the audio, my audio book for a manual for creating atheists is coming out any day now. I think it was oh, nice. held up by the Christmas holiday season. But, uh, so basically that's it. So we're going to have a, um, each week we're going to focus on either a specific, uh, superstition and you know, we go to a mega church, for example, or one of them I conducted an intervention at a book reading, et cetera. And then we have follow, follow up to see if the treatment stuck. And we're very honest about those if there didn't, just like I am in the book, right? I mean, I put mm-hmm. a lot of conversations in there that, that failed. And so I think that's important for people to see. And again, you know, we're using this thing in the book I read about the trans theoretical model. We're just bumping people one, one knot, uh, down or up, depending on how one looks at it, the trans theoretical model. And so the show, once we find a backer or backers, it depends. We might go to Showtime or, HBO, or we may um, we may kickstart it, or we may do a YouTube channel. We're really not sure what we're going to do yet, but that's the the basic thrust of it. And then every week we're going to have a, a, a notable uh, skeptic come on and talk about uh, say something germane based upon the episode we've we've filmed, the footage we have. So this is going to uh, still be basically following the book, uh, tackling faith, or is there going to be other topics to tackle as well? Uh, other topics, faith, alternativism, medicine, etc. My buddy, Matt Thornton, is at Aliveness Ape uh, on Twitter. He has a show coming out called Man vs. Superstition. It's going to mm-hmm. be fantastic. Um, so he's going to do the the entire um, gamut of, of uh, the, the, the whole suite, if you will, of um of uh, superstitions, the initial episodes that we've done just focus on faith broadly, and then we're going to do other superstitions, uh, uh, alternative medicine somewhat, uh, uh, UFO conspiracy theories somewhat, and then we're gonna we're gonna put the footage out, whether or not it works or not. We're gonna we're gonna be extremely honest with people. Awesome. Yeah, and again, I think that the someone asked me when I was in Hollywood, what's the biggest challenge that you're gonna face on this? I think the biggest challenge that we face is that people will think it's scripted and that these are actors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No actors. There are no actors in this. And I would think that in today's day and age, people would just use the internet or those people would come forth or what have you. There are no stooges in this. Everybody's legit. Don't go for the overly pretty people. We just get to whoever will sign the release. You know, I, I don't have any idea who's going to sign the release. Um, <laughs> but if they say, right, because we have to have a release or mm-hmm. um, when they get sucked back into those communities of delusion, uh, so, sometimes they become more calcified in, in the silliness they believe. So, so yeah, so I'm super excited about that. And I have a game coming out, too, that's, that's going to be pretty fun, hopefully. Uh, we, I have seen the... Uh, I say hopefully because I haven't seen the, uh, they, they're doing this thing called a waterfall iteration. And I know that the version that we have now is super fun to play. And we have a, a local, everything is based in Portland. We have a local artist and basically teaches people how to think critically in a way that works on a uh, attitudinal disposition and also in a way that is very non-hostile and non-adversarial and non-threatening to people. So I'm excited about that. And, uh, I'm, I'm preparing for my job to be slashed at Portland State University, which, frankly, I was astonished that I got my contract renewed this year. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling that it's uh, that's the it's not going to be renewed next year. So, you got tenure too, don't you? No, don't be a fool, son. Uh, <laughs> no, not only do I not have tenure, but I was told uh, if you if you read the acknowledgments of the book, you could you could publish ten critically received books from Harvard, and you'd never get tenure here. Portland State University would never give me tenure or an opportunity to have tenure ever under any circumstances, period. So, um, so yeah, so I'm doing my own thing and hopefully I'll be out of Portland State pretty soon. Uh, maybe a uh, read or another little college or maybe no college at all. And I'll just write books and, uh, do that. But the state is in very, very, very serious financial 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, underfunded the public education system terribly, and there are consequences for that. They, they I think it's uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's ten million. They need to come up. They need to, and then that that they're making ten million in cuts on top of cuts they've already made. So. My days there are numbered. I mean, it's just a matter of time. Frankly, I was very surprised my contract got renewed. I'm full-time faculty, but I am not tenured, nor do I ever have an opportunity for, for having that, uh, having tenure. I would have mm-hmm. thought with that horrible, shitty, shitty income tax that uh, Oregon has that, you know, they would have the money to take care of stuff like that. Well, again, it, it's, I guess, an emerging theme from the, our conversation is it's a value. People don't value public education, and mm-hmm. they, the legislature has consistently cut Again, it's it's not that people at PSU, I mean, the dean is, a, I'm not saying this for any political reason. Again, I'm going to be out of there pretty soon, so it doesn't make a difference. And she never listened to this anyway. But she's a great, she's a great person. You know, there are a lot of really great people there, and they're trying to do their best, but they have no money. There's yeah. just no money. Their system mm-hmm. has no money. The system is insolvent. So you can be the best person in the world, but if you're trying to do something and, and you don't have any money, it doesn't make a difference what you're trying to do. There's just no money. So, uh, so, you know, I mean, I, some, I mean, it's, it's just a horrible situation. You know, it's it's a it's a it's terrible for everybody. It's terrible for the students. It's terrible for the faculty. It's, but the the consequence of not having money is that people are going to have to lose their jobs and classes will get bigger, et cetera, et cetera, among other things. So, yeah, my days there are, are numbered. Well, best of luck on finding a lot more. Because man, you are on the up and up on the on the atheist circles. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really worried about, uh, I'm not really worried about a job or anything like that. Um, uh, I'm not even concerned about it, frankly. I, I mean, I'd be, I'd be kind of bummed if, uh, cause I like teaching and I, I find it to be stimulating and I like the relationships I develop with my students, but I'm not really worried at all about losing a job. I know some of my colleagues are petrified about it. I'm not really worried about it. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't know about the up and up. I mean, that it, I really, I'm really sincere when I say it. it doesn't really matter to me, you know. I mean, of course, external validation is nice, but you know, I, um, um, how, how old are you guys? Twenty nine, uh, thirty three. Okay, well, wait until you get to be forty seven. At least <laughs> in my case, I think about things differently. It doesn't matter to me if I'm up and up. Look, I mean, the vast majority of my life, hopefully not the vast, but the majority of my life is certainly behind me. Uh, died in an earthquake, heart attack. Uh, I was reading the time. 2013 people we, we lost, I think was the title of it. And since my mom died, I've always been interested in how people die and, you know, like what, what age they die. It doesn't really matter to me, uh, whether or not I'm on the up and up. I'm going to make sure I leave this place better than when I came in. And at the moment, the way that I'm going to do that is to attack and try to eradicate the most pernicious of all epistemologies. And that's faith. I'm not going to be on the atheist thing forever. I'm going to turn my attention, uh, maybe a little skepticism, but I'm going to turn my attention to uh, other pressing issues that we have. Notably, um, two things that I've become increasingly concerned with are environmental issues and, and uh, wealth disparity, particularly wealth disparity between the, uh, the um, people who have a lot of money and those billions of people or billion people who live on under a dollar a day. And so something something needs to be done to ameliorate that, but I think that the contribution that I can make in that is to help people to conceptualize or think about that. What tools of thought can we bring to analyzing these problems that can manifest themselves in a, a tangible way to help people? So, um, yeah, that's what I mean. That, that's next. And then hopefully uh, I have two kids and I'm going to try to pay for their college education. Hopefully once that happens, then I can start watching all the science fiction I've missed, catch up on Game of Thrones. Uh, play some video games. I love playing video games. I've been so busy with the faith virus eradicating that. It's a full-time job. <laughs> Hopefully I can uh, then turn myself to other greener pastures relaxing. Wow. You, you you probably actually grew up with Pong, didn't you? I did. I grew up with Pong, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the universe. Uh, nice. I was playing, I you know, I find it very relaxing. I love tower defense games. I play this game on my phone. Whenever I I, uh, I just need a break, I just had enough. I play this game called a uh, uh, Balloons Tower Defense Five, Balloons TD Five. It is a phenomenal game. And on the computer, I was playing uh, Orcs Must Die Two, which is a it's, <laughs> a it's a fantastic game. I one of the most underrated games uh, out there. But uh, again, I, I don't really have much time for that, um, particularly since uh, 
you know, you always have to weigh your own personal enjoyment against the, you know, helping people and kids and these and you're trying to be a dad and trying to be a husband and you try to stay in shape and you're trying to maintain your friendships and you try to do the right thing and, you know, everybody, everybody is just trying to do the right thing, you know, just some people have been, um, some people have been indoctrinated into communities that, that make it, make it so that they think what they're doing is the right thing, but they're not actually doing the right thing. And the question is, how can we help those people? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So I'm, I'm always curious about you. Uh, how did you grow up? Were you, were you born religious? No, no, it was never really religious. Uh, went to the Armenian church, but, uh, never really, never really affected me. And I'm the, uh, went to a uh, local uh, Catholic high school. Uh, I always seen, I always seen the whole thing as rather silly. So no, I wasn't really, I wasn't really raised so, in a religious way. You actually went to the Armenian church. Uh, what was it Catholic? Uh, apost- Armenian apostolic. Uh, uh-huh. It always just struck me as a really silly, it's just extreme silliness. I never really took it seriously. So I didn't even really consider it as something that one should or should not believe. And then I went to Catholic high school and Catholic college. Um, I love philosophy and studied psychology and philosophy and, but no, I never, never really believed it at all. Okay. So that's, that's actually kind of curious to me. You went to a nationalistic church. Uh, are you first or second generation? My dad's Armenian. Uh, my mom's Greek and Italian. My mom's dad was from Greece. My mom's mom was from Italy. My, my dad's mom and dad were from Armenia, like hardcore old school Armenia. Mm-hmm. But it, you know, so it wasn't until I really started teaching. I think this is the, you're asking me about the genesis of this. Um, I, I think, I think the way that the situation, or, you know, situation is kind of negative, but I taught so many people for so long that I, I really was uniquely situated in my, my position in that I basically got to ask people, why they think the way they do and what they believe and how they know what they know as part of philosophy. I used to teach a lot of ethics. I don't anymore. And I came to the rather obvious conclusion that people don't have the faintest clue of why they believe what they believe. Mm-hmm. And so um, I used to do these seminars and I used to call it the rule of the three whys. I don't know if I came up with it or someone else came up with it. I have no idea, but um, I think I came up with it. It doesn't matter. Uh, so, you know, people can usually take their beliefs down one to one why, why they believe something, but they can't take them down to three. For example, you know, why do you like this movie? I like it because it's good. Well, what makes it good? It's good because I like it. Well, why do you like it? Because it's good. So there's this vicious circularity in some things, you know, oh, I like it because it's really the, the actors have this gravitas and it's just the production values are great. And I found the plot compelling with the, you know, love affair, you know, whatever it is. Um, but, but I, I realized that there's a type of, um, that there, that there are really pernicious, dangerous beliefs that people hold that are ill founded. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and that they, they're not even in, they're not merely in the realm of, um, faith, faith based thinking. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, it kind of morphed into all these things. And, uh, anyway, oh, it's, a, it's a long story. I probably give you more detail than you wanted. <laughs> But yeah, I could I could definitely see, especially with the uh, teaching ethics, needing people to figure out why they believe what they believe to under so that, that you can help them understand why they value what they value. Yeah, and and uh, that's yeah, that, that's right. And I th- there are so many dangers and pitfalls that people fall that people dig themselves into. You know, they dig themselves into these cognitive sinkholes. And again, I, I truly don't think it gets back to Plato's question about, you know, are, are there, do people knowingly do bad things? I don't, I don't thought about that a lot. I don't, I really don't think so. I think that, that, uh, that people get trapped in a make believe picture of reality and people think that they're doing the right things and that they're, they're acting on the, the, they're doing the right things for the right reasons, but they, they're lacking information. They don't have all of the information. And of course, I include myself in that category. I include all of us in that category. And so the question is, how can we, is, is there anything that we can do to help people to f- develop more reliable ways to come to knowledge so that they can manifest that in their daily living so that they can help their communities and flourish as human beings? Well, the answer is obviously yes, right? Mm-hmm. So so then the next question is, how do we provide people with the tools 
particularly people who don't want their behavior changed. So, and I did some stuff in the prisons with that. And, um, so I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. And th- there are things in the literature, like the Dunning Kruger effect, et cetera, that, that there are a lot of people who they don't think, of. for example, one of my colleagues said something, my dog wants to come back in. One of my dog, one of my colleagues said something to me that the reason why so many people hate teaching ethics is because there's kind of a knee-jerk absolutism that students have. They think they're masters of ethical reasoning. And nowhere is this more obvious than in the prisons. Yeah, pe- people are extremely insular. I mean, I mean, they have their own little social groups. They stay within those, in the, within those boundaries most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, another, another thing that I noticed in your book that you brought up the point about like, uh, Google, Google searches yeah. that, uh, those are, those are actually really formed around what you search for the most often that they'll give you different hits, uh, based on what you previously searched for. Yeah, that's right. And so how, how do we, the, the problem with all these things is it cements in the book what I call doxastic closure. It cements the idea of, of, uh, belief closure and it, people then tend to assign higher confidence values to their beliefs than is warranted by the evidence. Mm-hmm. So again, I don't think that that's something, in fact, I'm, I'm quite confident that while confirmation bias does play a role in our thinking, you know, people seek out pieces of information uh, people seek out pieces of information. The problem is that we, we have these beliefs and that those, those, the problem is that we have these beliefs that through, through no fault of our own become reinforced by our communities, by our friends. Sean Faircloth said it's like an affinity getter. And I think that's the mm. perfect term for it. Um, we have these, we, we don't, what we should do is we should seek out disconfirming instances of belief. We should try to disconfirm the things that we believe. But again, the way that our brains are wired, confirmation bias plays a part. And, um, and, and we're not, we're not, it, it takes a lot of training to weed out uh, to, to think in this way. It takes a lot of, of training. And again, there are other cultural and social factors that reinforce that. Um, and we see the dangers of that everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, do you guys have any other questions? Anything you want to talk about at all? Does that have to be both the book, TV, show, anything you want? It's your show. Ah, uh, I actually, I think I'm, I'm good. Wesley, You're cool, dude. I, I think we've actually, I've, I've actually covered basically all my questions that I had. I appreciate the fact that you guys read the book and <laughs> took the time to contact me and uh, talk about these ideas. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's great that you guys <laughs> read the book, and I'm really being very honest when I say that. Uh, I'd also say it's not enough, though. You need to actually use the techniques in the book. You, you don't necessarily have to be active in going out and using the techniques, but but if if the opportunity avails itself to you, like you said, you were at the booth and you kept mm-hmm. caught part of the conversation, um, just remember, though, that if you turn these things into debates, you have a very real possibility of worsening someone's epistemic situation. So, mm. so you need to be responsible um, and uh, not make somebody's situation worse. Yeah. All right, Peter. Thank you very much for coming on Atheist Nomads. Oh, my pleasure, guys. It was a it was a great to talk to you. Send me the link when it comes out, Will and uh, I I very much appreciate your time. All righty. Have a good one. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, sir. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads. Weird. I don't know what's to... Why? Why? Do you have you Skype? You, sa- you actually sound good when you shout. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll uh, try again. Okay. So we should cut that out. Yeah. <laughs> this whole thing. Anyways, yeah. Um. Well, that's really all I got for history. Yeah, all righty. Yeah. It is time for something. <laughs> First off, we've got... Let me find his name. Wakata. Oh, shit, that's the name of the astronaut.
a uh, Cedar City, Utah gentleman. Uh, no, I'm not going to call him that. <clears throat> God damn, I need another glass of wine. <laughs> All right, go get it. Before these fucking Mormons piss me off anymore. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah, fuck. Uh, but anyways, uh, that... Fuck. Uh, fuck, fuck, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's on page 87. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doggy style. Uh,